Welcome back to the bubbly world of Master Glass. On this episode, we're gonna talk about that wonderful sparkling wine from France called Champagne. We're gonna talk about how you can pick the one you like and how you can mix the one you like. Let's get into this. So let me preface by saying that I actually enjoy the ritualistic and the congratulations and the celebratory aspect of drinking champagne far more than I actually enjoy the beverage itself. I'll have a glass once in a while, but I actually like mixing it more than I like drinking it. And so this episode today is going to be as important for me to learn as it is for you because it's going to help me really understand what style here that I could gravitate to a little bit more and I've never had the opportunity to really go and drink side by side to really figure out what style of champagne I enjoy the best. Okay, so what exactly is champagne? Champagne is a sparkling wine made in France uh, and uh, it is made in an appellation called Champagne. And the cool thing about this sparkling wine, amongst many other rules, is the way they actually make the bubbles. So what they will do is they will add the base wine inside of the bottle, and then inside of it, they'll add more sugar and more yeast. Now, sugar attacks yeast, thus creating what is called a secondary fermentation. And that secondary fermentation is what gives this a Champagne that nice velvety uh, and elegant bubbly component to it. Not all sparkling wines are made that way, which is why not all of them can stand up to the elegance of champagne. Uh, only other rule really to point out that's important is that champagne is mostly made with red wine grapes, Pinot Meunier and Pinot Noir. The third grape that is allowed is Chardonnay, which is a white uh, grape. Now, uh, there are many ways to understand how you appreciate champagne, uh, but I like to really break them down into two styles. Many people do this as well. And there's a style of champagne, which are the three that I have over on this side here to my to the left, are really crisp, refreshing, and easy drinking bubbly wines. Whereas the three that I have over on this side are gonna showcase a little bit more nuttiness, butter notes, uh, some toastiness, and they're just gonna be a little bit more uh, complex. Um, uh, now, uh, allow me uh, just a few seconds of nerdiness. The crisp and vibrant champagnes are what experts will call reductive. And what this means is that these wines are in very minimal contact with oxygen, thus creating a wine that's crisp, vibrant, and so easy to drink. More rich and nutty and complex champagnes are what experts will call oxidative. Now these wines here, they do have a little bit more access to oxygen. Typically their base wine will either be fermented or aged in oak, thus giving it that oxygen. And that oxygen is gonna give you those nutty flavors that are gonna be really complex and really good. So the first champagne I'm gonna try today is Nicolas Fouillat. The winery was founded in 1972, which was a great year. This bottle here comes at 12%, and the region where it comes from is called Chouilly in France. And I'm not gonna make like very extensive tasting notes. This is gonna just be broad strokes, um, and we'll, uh, so we can get to the point on which one I would like the most. It does have a little bit of toastiness nose on it. Yeah, a little nuttiness to it. Mm. Nice and refreshing and green apples and a little fun little tartness to it, a little lemony, um, but exactly the style that I was looking for or that I was talking about when we were explaining the first half. This is very refreshing. It's not incredibly complex, just very fresh, crisp and light. So the next one I'm gonna try is Moet and Chandon. This winery was created in 1743. It's located in Epernay, uh, France, and it is also coming in at 12%. Uh, let me go ahead and give this a smell. It does have a little bit more biscuity notes on the aroma, a little more complexity than uh, it's uh, the previous one. And here, uh, there's still that green apple lemoniness, but it's less pungent or it's less dominant with those highly acidic flavors. And it's just a little bit more well balanced with a touch of nuttiness notes to it. So uh, this one here would be a little bit more refreshing, uh, lemon juicy. This one here would be lemon juicy, but just a touch of uh, balancing uh, uh, acts to it. 
really, really nice. Okay, so the next one that I have here is Henriot. This here comes at 12% as well. This is the Millezy May 2008, which from what I heard was a great vintage. Let's go ahead and try. Oh, already on the aroma, there's a little bit more toffee. There's a little bit more uh, sherry notes to this, uh, to the nose on this one. Mm. Oh yeah, a lot more complexity in this one. So I actually like the progression. We went from very uh, f uh, bright and refreshing to this one, which was also very bright and refreshing, but just a notch, a little bit more complex. And now we've gotten here where it's still light, my mouth is still puckering and, and still watering, but there's just a little touch more of complexity, complexity in the Henriot 2008. Really, really nice. Okay, so the next one that I have here is Rotor, also called Collection 242. This is a fairly new style that they're making. And in this wine here, there's more of a, um, let's call it a ex experiential uh, taste to it. It's not going to taste the same every year. Uh, it's going to have, it's gonna taste like a vintage wine, even though it's a blend and there's just not one vintage inside of this bottle. It comes from Rames and it is bottled at 12%. Yeah, and this is definitely already I'm getting what the oxidative style smells like because the aroma here just does showcase a lot more toast and, and, and funk to it. Yeah. So in this bottle here, that lemon zest is still there, but it really took a back seat to what is more brioche, toasty, nutty flavors and I'm now getting the uh, acidity that's kicking in try, kind of at the end but it's almost like the acidity and the nuttiness and toastiness are in a really cool way competing with each other so I'm getting a little bit of toastiness a little bit of lemon my mouth is watering uh, this is an incredible uh, champagne as well uh, because of that yin and yang that it is uh, showcasing Okay, next in the oxidative style, I have Alfred Gratien. This one here actually comes at 12.5% alcohol by volume, so just a notch above what I have tasted before. Uh, the funny thing about this one, or the interesting thing about this one, is when I poured it, the bubbles were uh, really vibrant, so it, it, it showed a lot more excitement from a bubble standpoint. And the aroma, just nice and toasty, buttery, Yeah, just a, a nice, a, a, a rich butter, like a butter smothered with just some uh, almond hazelnut blend on top. Really, really nice, the aroma here. Mm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, here, the that toasty butteriness is again very present. Uh, a little bit of maybe apricot peach uh, flavor to it. A little bit of floral notes as well. And again, the competition here between the citrus and the freshness and those nutty toasty notes is also here. But in this case here, the citrus is kind of losing and the, and the uh, more nutty complex flavors are winning, thus making this one uh, the most complex one that I have had uh, so far in this tasting and really delicious. And last but not least, I have uh, definitely a popular uh, champagne, which is Vuv Clicquot uh, Brut, also known as Yellow Label. This was created in 1772. It's from Rames and it comes at 12% alcohol uh, by volume. All I'm getting here is that nuttiness and toasty brioche aroma to it. A real small hint of a, of a green apple, but really buried there on the bottom. Mm. I love the texture of this wine. It's really, really nice. And here, uh, this is, I would say, probably the most balanced one because I'm getting uh, that complex toastiness, but I'm getting a lot more lemon as well, almost in a really balanced way. Uh, so this one here, I would call it 
uh, the safe bet uh, so far, meaning if you really don't know which one you like, uh, probably getting your hands on this bottle here and trying to figure out if you like its complexity more or its uh, acidity and freshness more would be a good way to tell you if you then want to go this way or if you want to go this way or if, hey, you found your match and, and here it is. Uh, very cool. So now what I want to do is I want to make a cocktail and I want to use a very toasty version and I want to use a very uh, fresh version and I just want to see the difference to see how this all pans out. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make a champagne cocktail uh, with both different uh, most expressive versions of the champagne. And right now I'm just going to go ahead and saturate this sugar cube with Angostura bitters. Um, the dashes, I can't really tell you the dashes because everybody, every dasher will dash a little differently, but you do want it to be nice and highly saturated. I'll do the same with this one over here as well. You want to get the, the sugar cube to the point where it's going to melt really easily and this is already allowing it to kind of do that so that when you pour in your other ingredients it's going to work well for you. Uh, some people do add cognac to the champagne cocktail. I'm going directly uh, champagne. So in this version over here I'm going to use the Nicolas Fouillat and I'm just going to top it almost all the way up to the top um, to see exactly what this nice crisp style will give us here. Okay. And then on the oxidative side, I'm going to take advantage of some of those complex notes that was given to us by Alfred Gratin. And there we go. Okay, want to make sure that all the ingredients are cold, including your glassware. I'm just going to give this a nice little stir, allow that uh, sugar cube to continue to dissolve for me inside of the wine. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to promote the dissolving of the cube a little faster by giving this a little mush right here. I'll do the same over here. Okay. Now, by the way, the story of the glassware is really uh, of an opinion, depending on who you ask. Some people will say that the flute itself is just an obsolete glass and that these uh, that champagne should be served in a wine glass uh, or an all-purpose white wine glass. And some people will tell you that if you're actually drinking the oxidative style, the white wine glass is a must because it allows to showcase more of those flavors. But if you're drinking uh, the style over here, which is a little bit more fresh and crisp, then the flute does a better job. Um, uh, of course, that's a matter of opinion. So you can decide on your own which one of those you prefer. Apples to apples here, we're just gonna squeeze a little lemon peel and drop in on both of them, just like that, and just like that. Okay, let's see what happens here. First one over here, as I mentioned, it was with Nicolas Fouillat. I do want to, again, give a little more of a stir here, give them both a chance to have that final mix. And let's see what happens. Just nice, crisp, refreshing, easy drinking. Love the way those um, nice zesty notes of the champagne are blending in with this bitters and, and um, uh, um, herbaceous notes of the Angostura with those cloves and cinnamons. I'm getting a bunch of, of flavors to it. And let's see how it compares to this one. Mm. Two drinks identical, two completely different ball games. This one here seems so much more bold. I mean, infinitely more bold. A lot more flavor, a lot more nuttiness, a lot more serious. This one here is playful. This one here is really, really a serious champagne cocktail. So it really depends on what mood are you in? Are you looking for something light, refreshing, puckery, easy to drink? Is it maybe afternoon, not evening, and so you don't want something really, really big yet? I would gravitate over to this side. Uh, vice versa, if you're uh, maybe already accompanying this drink with a big meal, um, you're definitely going to want to go over on this side over here with one of these three and get something a little bit more bold. Now, I honestly thought that I was going to going to gravitate to this side home run. Mm. 
which I do love, but it's not a home run because mm, I am enjoying this. And again, because champagne and its cocktails are so ritualistic, right? They're tied into a bigger ritual than the beverage itself. I would almost say afternoon, easy drinking, go over here. At least that's what I would do. Evening, black tie, big dinner, all of that stuff, go over here. Um, but hey, let me know your thoughts below if you do uh, try this experiment and let me know what you found. And uh, if you found any value in this episode today, why don't you go ahead and give us a comment below and maybe give us a like and subscribe, smash the bell, do all those wonderful things so that you can get notified when I have more videos and you can come back to Masterclass with me, Livio Laro, where you get expert instruction for everyday consumption.